Okay, we're going to get started with an invocation from Pastor Chris Symes of Cornerstone United Methodist Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Councilwoman Nikki Nice. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are grateful to be here today and on this week where all of us remember the importance of giving thanks. We are grateful to you for the blessings you've poured out on us from the clothes on our back to the food in our cupboards to our friends and family. And God, I want to thank you for the leaders in this place, for their diligence and commitment to make our city better. Lord, I pray for their families, for them. God, for your blessings upon them and uh, strengthen them today and help them with any burdens or struggles they may be carrying. God, I believe that you love this city, that you desire to see it filled with goodness and peace and justice and beauty. And Lord, I pray for these leaders that you would give them wisdom, strength, and perseverance to work towards that. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let us pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. And we have a, a few items under Office of the Mayor. We'll begin with item 3A, Resolution Approving Travel and Reimbursement of Travel-Related Expenses for the Mayor, that's me, to attend the U.S. Conference of Mayors in January. This is their annual winter meeting. Our Mayor has always traditionally gone, and I would like to continue that tradition, so I would entertain a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Uh, passes unanimously and with, oh, and with the required six votes. Uh, we have item 3B. I will explain that uh, in, in both cases, 3B and C, uh, Councilwoman Nye, I am appointing Councilwoman Nice to uh, replace Councilman Cooper, and I'm glad we could get this right on the docket presently. Um, <clears throat> Ward 7 is the representative this, this year for the MAPS 3 Citizens Advisory Board. Of course, she'll be the third Ward 7 council member to, uh, to, to hold that position this year, but we think you're going to stick. And, uh, and then we've got uh, the tradition of appointing the Ward 7 council member to the Zoo Trust. So uh, I would entertain a motion for item 3B, the appointment of Nikki Nice to serve as a member of the MAPS 3 Citizens Advisory Board. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then we have item 3C, appointment of Nikki Nice to serve as a member of the Oklahoma City Zoological Trust. Move the item. I got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then we have item 3D and 3E, which are related to the um, continuing uh, search to replace Mr. Couch as the uh, city manager. Uh, item 3D is enter into executive session upon the advice of the municipal counselor to conduct interviews for the office of the city manager and confer regarding those interviews. We actually probably don't need that item. Uh, we're not conducting any interviews today. But we do have 3E, which is uh, one, option is resolution appointing a city manager. Option two is enter into executive session to discuss the applicants for terms of employment for, et cetera. Um, we probably do need item 3E2. Um, Francis, on item 3D, if we choose not to uh, exercise that, is that OK? That's OK. It can be stricken Okay. Okay. Are we going to put them both or just one into executive session? Um, I mean, isn't the safe thing to do to just put both into executive session? I mean, you just did, yeah, fine. Yeah, we'll just take an, I'll take a, a, a motion for 3D, and then we'll, we'll do 3 Move the item into executive session. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, catch your votes. Passes unanimously. And then I entertain a motion for 3E2 as well. Move the item into executive session. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, catch your votes. Passes unanimously. That concludes Office of the Mayor. We have Journal of Council Proceedings, items A and B. We can take those with one motion. <clears throat> Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That takes us to requests for uncontested continuances. And we have quite a few listed already in addition to whatever you might add, Mr. Couch. Right. Let's talk about the ones that are listed on the agenda because there are so many. Uh, item 
9C1 and 2 has to do with, with a, a sco the scooter issue, and that's being recommended to be deferred until December 18th. Item 9D has to do with the pre-qualification ordinance, and there were some changes made on that, so we ask that that also be continued until December 18th. Items 9E and 9F both have to do with home sharing, and we're recommending that those be deferred until December 18th. Mr. And Couch, then, there's an issue. Um, well, how about, about he lists them all, and then okay. I would love to hear from you. It, and then items 9J and 9K, those are the unsecured and uh, abandoned items regarding Lincoln Plaza, and we ask that those be stricken at this time. Uh, so those are the items. I have nothing to add to the beyond the, the, the six that are listed on the, in the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council, on the home sharing ordinances that Mr. Couch just mentioned. Uh, we're, we're going to ask that the Council defer those into after the holidays to the second meeting in January. The, if we defer it to December, there are people interested who cannot be here because they'll be away for the holidays. So unless there's some urgency to it, we would ask that it be continued, yourself. preferably until the second, yes, second meeting in January. Okay, so currently they're listed as being deferred to 1218. And you're proposing a meeting that I think Francis is looking up right now. Stand by, stand by. Uh, I told them. The second meeting is uh, January 15th. January 15th would be the second meeting in January. Um, and you. Oh. Um, David Box, of course, is involved in this as well. Um, and I can't speak for him. I mentioned it to him yesterday that I wanted to pass this from the, from the 20th, and I didn't hear any objection from him, and he's not here today. So. Okay. But I don't think he's going to. Now think let's move it to January 15th, which is the second meeting. Suits me. And this is items 9 E and F? Yes, there are two items involved. So we would be doing. One is, uh, it's E and F. Okay. It will also enable us to refine the ordinance to the point where people may be satisfied with it. Great. So. Um, okay, Francis, since this is solved, this conversation is happening under the request for uncontested continuances. Do we need to vote on any of this, or we just? Uh, we need to vote on it under the items to move the deferral to January uh, 15th. Okay. In other words, this was contested, so we're going to take them off this part ah, and got consider it. them under the item. Okay, we'll come okay. to that then. We'll uh, we'll handle that at that time, Eric. Thank you. Mr. Couch, on the um, Lincoln Boulevard items where we're striking it, Lincoln Plaza, where we're striking it. They have come up with a plan that has satisfied staff, and, okay. and, and so we're, we're, we continue to monitor the situation. Okay. But we are pleased with the progress that's been made uh, since the last council meeting. Okay. All right. If I may add, yes. I, I've also been driving by myself, and I had a meeting with um, everyone involved, so it does look very secure. So I'll keep checking okay. as I drive by Lincoln <laughs> in, the, in the future. Great. Okay. Well, that, that concludes requests for uncontested continuances. Items 9E and F will discuss uh, the deferrals when we get to that part of the agenda. Brings us to revocable permits. Item 6, we have item 6A, revocable right-of-way use permit with DG Productions to hold OKC turkey trucks on Thanksgiving Day. Um, Councilwoman Salyer is not here, um, but are you here to speak on the item? I am. My name is Carrie Ralston, and I'm with DG Productions. Um, thank you for all for your service to our community, and we're grateful for the support. This is our eighth year to have this run, so it, it is a fun family event Thanksgiving morning. We do a one-mile fun run at 8.30 and then a 5K uh, at 9 o'clock. So right now we've got about 2,000 runners uh, registered, and uh, we've been growing year after year. So, Okay, great. I would entertain a motion or questions, discussion. Move the item. We had a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have a great event. Thank you. You guys have a great Thanksgiving. <laughs> you too. We've got 6B, revocable right-of-way use permit with downtown OKC to hold the uh, 
Bricktown Tree Lighting Festival <clears throat> on Mickey Mantle Drive between Flaming Lips and Wanda Jackson. Um, and we've got Riley Cole here to uh, talk about the event. Yes, good morning. So we're hosting our annual Bricktown Tree Lighting Festival this Friday, uh, 5 to 7 p.m. And we're requesting to close down Mickey Mantle, Wanda Jackson to Flaming Lips. Yeah, and I would add, I've been personally interested in this event. It is the tradition for the mayor to light the tree. So we've got some fun additions, um, including um, a young lady singing uh, our hippo song, which I think is a, uh, an addition to the Christmas canon that came right here from Oklahoma City. And then also JB doing a, a Christmas medley, including uh, Christmas in Hollis. So I'm super excited about that. And um, this is Ward 7. So would you like to say anything or make a motion, Councilwoman Nice? I'm excited. Let's move the item. <laughs> All right. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. We'll see you Friday. Revocable right of way use permit with Downtown Oklahoma City Partnership to hold Bricktown Parklet December 4th through March 3rd uh, on Mickey Mantle Drive. And uh, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address. Joe Hudson, 211 North Robinson, 73102. Mm -hmm. uh, the revocable parklet, this is our, I think our second year going. Uh, it's a nice space for the public to sit and relax. Uh, it's just outside the third base plaza on the uh, Bricktown Ballpark. Um, we've got nice lights overhead and I think it's uh, a good use of public space. Great, thank you. Um, Councilwoman Nice? Sounds fun to me, move the item. <laughs> okay. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We have item 6D, revocable right-of-way use permit with Stockyard City Main Street to hold the Cowboy Christmas Parade on December 1st on exchange from South Penn to South Agnew. Um, and we have, it appears, Kelly. Hello. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Kelly Payne with Stockyard City Main Street. I'm the board president. This is probably our 25th, 26th year to host this event. We start with the Longhorns coming down the street, and that's just very well received. Last year we had four to 5,000 folks in at attendance for the event. This year we're very pleased to have Miss Jody Miller be our uh, Grand Marshal and she will also be inducted into the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame next week. So it's really special. She sings at the Opry down there, very beloved uh, member of our Oklahoma City community. So I appreciate everyone's support for the parade and ask for the blessing of the permit. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is also in Ward 6 and Meg is not here. Um, got a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank Have a great you. event. Okay, we will now recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, um, where we have items A through G, which we can take as one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. <clears throat> We will adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Here we have items A and B. Got a motion and a second for all of the items. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We will adjourn OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust where all we have is claims and payroll. We'll go ahead and take a motion on that. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, reconvene as the council meeting where we find ourselves on page five of the printed agenda, item seven, the consent docket. Very good. Motion and a second. And uh, do we have any presentations on here, Mr. Kaplan? We do have two presentations this morning. We have one on item AE, which is a uh, uh, economic uh, development allocation to Booz Allen. And we have one on AN, which is allocation of funds for wellness center number one. Okay. And does any council member have anything they want to pull out? Other than AN, no. Okay. All right. Well, then we will uh, start with those presentations. Uh, taking them in order, we'll have AE, joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust to be introduced and set for public hearing and final consideration on December 4th. And we have Teresa Lynch here this morning with Booz Allen. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. If you wouldn't mind stating your name and address as you begin. Um, Teresa Lynch, uh, 8283 Greensboro Drive, McLean, Virginia. Okay. To 
102. Welcome to Oklahoma City. Thank you. Are you going to? Okay, thank you. Um, very excited to be here today uh, with Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, we are a defense contractor um, headquartered in Virginia. We have an office here in Oklahoma City that was established in 2005. That has grown to over 90 full-time employees here um, in the Oklahoma City area. We have 25,000 employees worldwide. Uh, we're primarily a defense contractor. And about 97% of our revenue is generated currently from defense contracting, but we are expanding into the commercial space um, starting right here in Oklahoma. We're a solutions-oriented uh, company, so we work very closely with the Department of Defense and other federal agencies to work on uh, really the problems of today. We bring management consulting. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have a very uh, concentration of cybersecurity right here in Oklahoma City, engineering and consulting, and also um, digital solutions and analytics. Our clients uh, are composed of the Air Force, Air National Guard, Navy, as well as the FAA. And as I said, we are expanding into the commercial space. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just a little further explanation of our different types of practices. We talked a little bit of our, about our consulting practice, working side by side with our um, clients, government clients, to help solve the problems of today and tomorrow. We have a nice focus in data analytics, um, helping uh, the government with predictive analytics to help them understand what may be coming down the pike and start planning for those problems before they get here. Digital solutions is basically, we have a lot of software developers. Um, we're doing a lot of R&D here in Oklahoma and across the country to help uh, modernize what's happening uh, with uh, the government and also to streamline some of their applications. So we go in and we take a look at um, what's happening and we take our software developers and help bring what they're working on uh, up to date and to um, have better user interfaces and things like that. Engineering, we have a big uh, focus on engineering here. We work very closely with the Air Force. Uh, they called us in to help um, take a look at the B-52s and to see um, if there were ways to um, make them fly longer and we're working on a re-engineering um, and re-engineering program uh, on the B-52. So that's a very exciting project that's happening right here in Oklahoma. And of course, cybersecurity, that's really our bread and butter. We have deep expertise in cybersecurity, and we're working to build cyber hubs um, throughout the United States. And Oklahoma City has really proven as part of our portfolio to have a strong talent pipeline and have very talented employees and people that can do this kind of work um, right here in Oklahoma. Our facility is um, at 211 North Robinson. Uh, we have the ISO certifications as well as the British uh, certifications and German certifications in, um, in uh, quality. And if we can move on to the next slide. So um, we'd love to expand our operations here in Oklahoma City. Uh, we have, uh, I like to call them our um, number one employee here uh, from 2005. Tom Boyle is with us. He is the director principal of the office. and. He was the first employee here in Oklahoma City and has really helped build the practice. Um, he has given the leadership um, in, at our headquarters uh, confidence that we can grow our practice here uh, with the talent pipeline that we have and um, the workforce that we've created here has just been stellar and it is a perfect place for us to grow. Um, this project had competition throughout uh, the Booz Allen portfolio, and specifically Dayton, Ohio, and also in the D.C. metro area. I think with, um, you know, Amazon's decision to come uh, to the D.C. metro area is going to give us a lot of opportunity to um, grow our portfolio outside of the D.C. area where there's going to just be tremendous competition. So a place like Oklahoma City where the talent is great and we have a track record of success, um, you know, is just ripe for growth for us as um, things get a little uh, competitive up there and in the D.C. area. So we have offices here in Leadership Square. Uh, we're looking to take on additional space within 
the office. There's room for us to grow there, which is awesome. And we also have um, staff on uh, client site throughout Oklahoma City as well. We we generally work. Um, we like to work side by side with our um, our uh, clients so that we can help them hands on. So when we take a look at like we talked about the quality workforce, the really welcoming business environment here in Oklahoma City. Um, the incentives that you're able to bring to bear to help us make this decision and defray some of our costs. When we look across our portfolio throughout the United States, you know, the cost of operation is significant and important in our decisions. And um, so the incentives do make a difference when we decide where we're going to grow our practice. So what we're looking at, um, we're looking at a prob approximately $800,000 for the expansion, leasehold improvements, the equipment furniture that we would need to upfit the space. Um, as we talked about, we have 90 full-time employees. We are looking to create 130, so over doubling the staff here in Oklahoma over the next five years. Um, the new jobs average about $85,000 base salary with competitive benefits. And one thing I always like to mention, um, we have a real passion for uh, growing our talent. So Booz Allen provides 52 5200 to $20,000 a year um, to, for secondary education. It depends how long you've been with the company, and it also depends on um, you know, what your specialty is. But if you are a, a cyber engineer coming to work for uh, Booz Allen, you could get up to $20,000 a year for your continuing education. And that's pretty exciting, and that's hot off the press. It was 10,000, and now it's up to 20 per year. So they can come and they can get their masters, they can get their PhD, they can get their cert certifications, and all of that um, can be leveraged through Oklahoma schools. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the net new payroll is expected to be 11 million. Um, when you take a look at once we're ramped up. Um, it'll be about 11 million a year, um, and that doesn't count the 7.6 million um, average annual payroll that will will be for the employees that are already here, for the 90 that are already here. So when you take a look at the type of skilled labor that we're going to need, you can tell that they're really we need highly educated folks, um, and your universities and colleges. Um, you know, are putting out really high quali quality uh, people. And we can hire right here from Oklahoma City, uh, which is awesome for us. And so these are the types of jobs that we're looking for, uh, among others, in order to, um, to staff up for these jobs and this work that, that we'll be uh, doing here alongside our customers. Just to show you, um, you know, we are members of the community already. We've been here since 2005. We um, are part of the fabric of the community, and we also participate pretty heavily in the things that you're listed that are listed up there. And also, we participate in the job fairs that are happening throughout the state as well. Um, just some pictures. <laughs> we like to have fun. We like to give back. Um, we've got a, a really vibrant group. I love being able to come out and um, spend time with with our, our uh, teams out here and and. Um, they're, they're amazing, and so we just kind of gave you a little flavor of, of the kind of involvement and fun that we like to have here, right here in the community. And um, the other thing that I, I think I didn't mention was um, our veteran population. So right here in Oklahoma City, we have 50% of our employees are veteran or veteran connected, which is pretty amazing. Throughout the firm wide, it's a little over 30%. So um, we have a great uh, respect for uh, the veterans, and we love to um, invite them to come from the mission that they're serving in the military into the mission that we're serving for our for our customers. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question, but it's probably more for staff. Based on uh, how do we verify these aren't short-term contract positions? We will have to work with the company to make sure that they are um, that they are full-time positions with the company and not contract labor. Um, you know, 
we'll be negotiating an agreement with them that we'll bring back to you in about 60 to 90 days that will be our standard um, performance agreement. And um, part of that is that they must maintain the jobs they have now and create new jobs on, on top of that. So we'll have to work with the company um, to develop a procedure to make sure that that's the case. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to say thanks for the new jobs. Thank you. We're very excited about it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank, Thank you so much. And now A.N. We have Bill Fleming here this morning from uh, talk to us a little bit about Wellness Center Number 1. Morning, Bill. Morning. Welcome. Mayor, council members, staff, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity to make a presentation to you this morning. We're greatly excited about Wellness Center Number 1. It's exceeded all of our expectations. and. Uh, Claire Dowers Nichols, our uh, associate director, is going to make uh, the presentation for you this morning. I'll follow it up with a few comments after that, if that would be okay. Of course. So. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for allowing us a few minutes to, to visit with you. Um, I've been the executive director since July, and I've worked in uh, aging program development for over 15 years. Uh, in a state and national level, and I can tell you that what Oklahoma City is doing through these centers is very exciting. So we'd like to uh, paint the landscape for you about what's going on with center number one. Um, when the center first opened, the goal was to have 2,000 members by the end of the second year, which would be March 2019. We're now at 5,600 members, 5,620 members uh, as of last Tuesday. This graph will show our membership growth. Uh, you can see a positive trend. We average about 200 new members a month, net members. Um, and it's easy to think in terms of these are numbers and these are scan-ins a day and daily visits, but these are lives. These are stories that are changing in Oklahoma City because of what's going on. And I'd like to share a couple of those with you now. <clears throat> My name's Debbie, and my husband and I have been members here since June of this year. We originally joined because we uh, work on flipping houses, and in between, we need some exercise. So uh, a few weeks after we joined, I was actually diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer, and so things changed for us. But uh, in July, I had surgery, started chemo, and as soon as the doctor said I could, I started coming back up here so I could work out. Um, the best thing was I could work out on and go to classes on the levels I could do as I started my recovery because at first I could only do a little bit. I really enjoy a lot of the classes that I've done, the Tai Chi and the, I love the fitness first one where I could really get exercise and get some aerobic in. Uh, also love line dancing. That has been so much fun. I know a couple of the ladies in there. Uh, a couple of times the class has been so huge we've had to have four lines instead of three. Uh, a couple of men come, he doesn't, but a couple of other guys come. And so I enjoy the line dancing and it's just made my recovery process so much easier because it's all on my schedule and that's helped so much. My name is uh, Leslie Shaw. I've been a member of this place since March 2018. The best decision I ever made in my life was to join this place. What I love the most about this place is the friends I've made, the trainers like Cody, Morgan. They help me, you know, just out of the kindness of their heart. I would not trade my experience at this place for nothing in the world. I love it out here. The, from the staff, from the top people on down, I just love, love this place. Hi, I'm Carol and I've been a member of Healthy Living since it opened about a year and a half ago and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. A year ago I took the wellness class, Total Wellness it was called, that was offered here in the fall and I was able to lose 12 pounds by just learning how to eat healthier. I knew it all the time but you know we forget, <laughs> get into bad habits and portion control, etc. And so it's really been been wonderful. And it's really helped also to take a little bit of pressure off the knees and the hip, losing a few pounds. Good morning. Hi, I'm 
morning. Okay. So there are many, many stories. Uh, when we put the call out for a few volunteers, we had um, more than 30 that wanted to tell their story, but we want to honor your time with that. Um, and I think I've succeeded in not letting the hundreds of them come here um, like they wanted to. This is a slide showing just what an um, average month looks like. Uh, in September, October, data looks very similar. We had uh, almost 15,000 visits. A daily average of 619. Mondays are the spikes that you see there. They are uh, typically a, a minimum of 900 people on a Monday through our doors. Um, the low points are Saturdays. They are a little bit lower now that the fall, and I'm going to attribute that to college football, which I can certainly understand myself. Um, so a lot of traffic, a lot more traffic than we ever anticipated, but these are great problems. Uh, in Looking at uh, analyzing some of our membership data, we thought, well, maybe they're coming from really far out. Actually, they're not. 55% uh, of our membership is represented from the top three zip codes there surrounding the center. The, uh, and then 85% of our membership comes from the 10 surrounding zip codes. So they're not, we have a few outliers, but for the most part, they're pretty centralized. Um, a little bit more of a picture. Uh, weekly, we offer 55 different group fitness classes, 15 art classes, 10 special education events, 25 interest groups. This number continues to grow uh, because we're trying to keep up with the demand that the membership uh, is presenting. Uh, so this rapid growth, again, is great, but it has presented some key issues. We have a lack of parking. Parking was... Uh, had to be adjusted, I, be, I understand, in the first, the, in, upon construction due to some budget constraints. Well, locker rooms are very crowded, particularly the women's locker rooms. It was anticipated by the architects that older women would not use locker rooms. I can assure you that's not the case. Uh, when you have 60, 70 people in a swimming class, uh, uh, aquatic class, and then they compete for three showers and three changing rooms, you, you have a bit of a dilemma. Our art classes are at capacity. Art therapy is uh, very beneficial in, among older adults. Uh, many of the fitness classes are at capacity. We have moved many of them to the big gymnasium, which creates competition for other gym events. Uh, here's just a few pictures showing a day in the life. You can see that the rooms are pretty packed. Uh, these two pics show the parking situation that we have. The top picture is actually taken from the adjacent parking lot at the church that is just south of the building. Uh, we, I was taking this picture standing two rows deep into the church parking lot. And then the bottom picture shows um, the parking lot for an event. We have several large events each year that we require overflow parking and uh, Putnam City Baptist Church has been very generous in loaning us their golf carts, and so our volunteers help shuttle people in and out. So some priority requests. Expand the parking lot, first of all. Uh, purchase additional land for new construction. Uh, make some modifications to the current facility, which would expand the women's locker room, adding secondary art space, uh, build an additional gymnasium for those large events, for pickleball, for basketball, for the large group fitness classes, and then add some multi-purpose educational space. Uh, here's a rendering, uh, just very simple. You can see in the dark blue uh, the current facility and the black existing parking lot and the new gray parking lot, uh, and then a lot to the west. We would like to add a pickleball gym that would be used primarily for pickleball, but it would be built to very multi-purpose. An educational center, um, an outdoor sporting area, and then this shows it a little better. And then build on room, additional locker room space and storage, and then plan for a second pool that we realize uh, MAPS funding will not cover that, but we are committed to raising the balance uh, of what is needed as an organization so we can do this and uh, give our constituents really what they need. Um, I'll bring up Bill Fleming to discuss some of the budget points. Thank you. The numbers that you see are estimates of what these projects will cost. Uh, there may be some variance in that once we get the architects involved, get some plans drawn, and actually put everything out to bid. 
but we believe that we can accomplish what we've listed up there uh, with this uh, request. We're committed to raising private funding if we have to, if, uh, if the cost of construction exceeds that. The Wellness Center has been such a huge success that I, I can't see that we could do anything other than expand it and continue to allow it to grow. You probably have the greatest group of MAP supporters in Oklahoma City attending this facility. Uh, uh, they, they like it. They like MAPs. They like what's going on. And so we would ask that you would make this approval and allow us to expand this to continue the growth of what we believe can be uh, one of the most successful MAPs projects and maybe make this the model for wellness centers across the United States. Uh, everything that's going on out there is pretty exciting. I hope some of you have had the opportunity to come out and walk through and take a look at uh, what's actually happening. So we would welcome your support today. Thank you. If you have any questions, we'll try to answer them for you. The one thing I'd like to say, I'd like to echo and, uh, and comment on Bill's statement that uh, this could become a national model. Uh, and, and I really believe that it, it, it will become a national model and, and people will come from all over the country to see this. And I truly believe that this is going to be one of the greatest success stories of MAPS 3. Um, and through this process where we were trying to come up with the $3.5 million, uh, we learned about the lack of parking. We learned about the, uh, the, the female bathrooms that needed to be expanded. Uh, we learned about pickleball. I never learned about, I never knew much about pickleball, but that's an incredibly popular uh, sport uh, at the facility. And, but the most important thing I think I learned was um, this is not just about physical health. It's also about mental health. And it's getting our seniors out of their homes and into a facility where they engage and attend classes. And so um, I'd like to, I'd personally like to thank Claire, Bill Fleming, uh, Pastor Bill Hulls is back there. Would you stand up? Uh, these guys have been working around the clock. And I'd like to give them a big hand. Uh, a couple of questions, uh, and I do hope that all the other uh, senior wellness centers are just as successful. Uh, this is a great story. So can you tell me about the outdoor recreational space that you've got plans? Because I think that's an interesting concept to focus on. Uh, the outdoor recreational space would be built where it could be very versatile. Uh, so it would be, we've had a lot of requests for um, outdoor classroom space, outdoor areas where we could set up horseshoes or uh, the cornhole game that's very, very popular. Uh, right, yeah, per thank you. Uh, we've had many requests for croquet a lot. That's becoming, that's becoming very popular again. And we've heard that even uh, many of the country clubs and golf courses around the country are putting in croquet courses for those that used to golf but don't have that range of motion, that's something they can do. So we envision this being a very versatile space uh, that can uh, add, you know, let nature enhance the experience as, as well. Uh, Councilman Stonecipher spoke a lot about the psychosocial wellness factors of what's going on here in that outdoor space could allow for that as well. Any way we can get people moving. Sure. Can yeah. you uh, talk a little bit about the raised gardens for the handicap? I thought that was really... Oh, sure. We are now um, along the west, no, the east side of our building installing, we're fundraising privately and installing as we can purchase them, uh, raised beds for gardening. Gardening is very, very therapeutic, uh, though if it's done on the ground, it presents challenges for those with limited ambulation and, and range of motion, which... If you live long enough, you're probably going to experience. So we are working on, we're fundraising now. We have several beds out there now that people can roll up to if they're in a wheelchair. They don't, they're about this high. They're perfect heights for, uh, for people that are our size that can't bend down anymore. And we have a lot of programmatic components planned with some of the products of the gardening as well. Can can you remind me of the membership requirements? Do you have to be a resident of the city of Oklahoma City to become a you, member? We do not. Uh, our, resident, our membership requirements are age 50 and older. 71% of our residents are Oklahoma City residents, or our members are Oklahoma City residents. Doug Cupper with Parks and Recreation and I ran that number a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And it was well over the required 51%. Thank you. I also think this is going to 
that these senior wellness centers are transformational. I think it's the most, most transformational of all the MAPS 3 projects. It is, um, I, I spend my, the bulk of my medical practice trying to get people all day long into aquatic centers, and many, many cities just don't have those resources. Um, but, the, but the biggest impact is to spread it throughout the city and as many to, to as many people as possible can access it. So I thought this first one was controversial when we, when we put the initial senior wellness center in, in some of the wealthiest zip codes in the city. And, and, and we did it and, and we did what we, what we said we were going to do. We spent about 10, 11 million dollars a decade ago. We said we're going to, we're going to build like four or five of these. We'll spend 10, 11 million dollars on them and then we're off the hook for operations. Our partner will do, will do the operations. Um, so we did that. And then we, we built a second one near the Capitol Hill area with a, with a different philosophy that has a little more medical um, care coverage. Um, this is a massive, massive increase in that commitment and what we said we were going to do originally um, to go from 10 or 11 million to now adding three and a half million dollars um, is a massive uh, increase. If this is what we do on, on the other ones, if the second one and third one is just as successful and we add three and a half million, then we're basically making a policy decision today that we're only going to build four instead of five. Uh, there just won't be enough money. We have incredible data about zip codes in this city where people are not living as long as in the rest of the city where we are getting, where they are getting hit hard by uh, poverty and that's having tremendous impacts on health impacts, specifically, particularly in Ward 7 and in Ward 4. We know exactly where those zip codes are. That, that to me would seem to be the highest priority, is getting those things built in the zip codes where we have all this data and where we so desperately need these senior wellness centers. To spend $650,000 to buy some land, to, which I assume is going to the church, you have government giving $650,000 to a church for land to build a parking lot. To me, that's not the greatest impact on health, uh, public health outcomes, is to, is to spend a million dollars on land and an additional parking lot. Let's get, let's build five senior wellness centers and let's spread them out through the city. Let's target where we, where people are not living as long in this city. Let's not prioritize the zip codes, which are among the wealthiest in the city, with the best health outcomes in the city. That doesn't make sense to me. A little marginal increase, 500,000, 750,000, okay, but three and a half million dollars, a 35, 40% increase over what we originally committed to the, we said to the voters we're going to do, which will then preclude you from doing it in some other area of the city. I just don't understand why this allocation is so large. <clears throat> when we uh, did wellness center number one, it, it was a little bit controversial and uh, some people spoke to the fact that that was the wealthiest part of the city. But I would also point out to you that the, whether people are wealthy or whether people are poor, they still deserve the best that Oklahoma City can give them. And we built this center out there, and it's been hugely successful. And you're seeing people attend it from all parts of the city, and you're seeing life outcomes change. You're seeing people get involved and getting healthier in a lot of different ways, mentally, physically, emotionally. That impacts our city. It impacts every part of our city, not just northwest Oklahoma City. Healthy people in northwest Oklahoma City impact everything in our city. And I think it's critically important that we recognize that. I do think that the other wellness centers should be built, and I think that they should be supported in a way to where we can do as good a job there as wellness center number one is doing. But I would also tell you that wellness center number one is low risk also. We are actually in the black. So you don't have to worry about wellness center number one coming back to the city and saying, we need money for operations. So we're able to fund that and keep it going, and we've committed not to go far beyond what we're asking for here in trying to raise money for, an, uh, for a second pool of the other amenities. And there are a lot of things going on out there, and I would encourage you 
not only to fund Wellness Center number one, and this is a large number, and we understand that, but the impact is going to be tremendous to the citizens of Oklahoma City, and that money will be recovered time and time again by having healthier people in northwest Oklahoma City. And actually, people drive in from other parts of the city, too. So I would encourage you to support this. Make it a model. Develop it. Do the very best that you can with it. And then take it and do it in south Oklahoma City and do it in northeast Oklahoma City and do it in other parts of the city. But I think that uh, it would certainly bless Oklahoma City and every part of the city by expanding this. I think just on, on Bill's comments, um, I, I think the one thing, if your organization is looking at participating in, in one of the other wellness centers that's, that's on, the, on the map. And, uh, and the second thing is that the importance of this is we had hoped by January 1 of this year to have 1,000 members. We're at 5,600 members. I get emails, I get phone calls that say the females' bathrooms are inadequate. There's not enough showers. Uh, and and there are, our, our elderly are walking from the church parking lot to get to this facility. We're out of room. Uh, and so I would encourage everybody to vote for this. It's a success story. Let's work on other wellness centers, uh, and let's pattern our other wellness centers after this one that has been successful. Thank you. Well, I would just like to Oh, if I could add one comment that hadn't been stated. Would you state uh, your name? Bill Hulse, uh, pastor of Putnam City Baptist Church. Uh, in our first wellness center, it was built two years after the proposal was supposed to be built. did not have inflation built into those costs, where all the other wellness centers that are being built have an inflation rate that adds to their projects. So we came in with some budget deficits. Parking lot was cut completely in half. That caused our problems. The locker room scaled back to fit within a budget that didn't have the inflation. I think that needs to be noted. We're not doing this land just to build a parking lot. It is to expand building space. It is to expand outdoor space, orchards that aren't on there that we're talking about, outdoor gardening, as well as the other amenities. So it's much more extra extravagant in what it's providing than a parking lot. Then tell them about the ponds. Yeah, and we are also proposing a, a walking track around the outside. Those would be extra funds that we are willing to build as an organization to bring to that, but that space needs to be there. That's a lot of bodies that are coming to one location that needs to be spread out throughout that campus, and it's going to require more than the acreage we have. Councilman Greenwell, you had something to say? Well, just uh, to bring out these, this point, <clears throat> the uh, Capitol Hill Center has been open since, uh, we are now in November, since I think May uh, is when the ribbon cutting occurred. And, and I don't think that the attendance is anywhere near this uh, membership. So it's great to say, let's get these in certain parts of the city, but we've got to be concerned with the usage at every location. These individuals have certainly demonstrated the demand is there for this wellness center. Let's support this demand. And then let's go out and find why we aren't obtaining the same type of membership numbers at the other ones. And then in regards to the number three wellness center, some of that delay has been with respect to various individuals that this council as a whole didn't have anything to do. The money's been there. There's just been delays in getting that facility up and running. And, and so let's, let's just you know, focus on what we have, and certainly this one is a success. Let's not hold them back. Let's continue to support them and use it as a great example for future wellness centers. Um, I wondered if David Todd could come forward, because to Councilman Shadid's comment about the fifth center, I don't feel like I'm voting against a fifth center by supporting this allocation today, but, but I would like, but maybe I'm wrong, and so I'd like to get the context of this $3.5 million in the totality of MAPS 3, specifically senior centers. Right, there's, there's a lot of nuances here. Um, we presently have about 21 million. We presented a plan to the advisory board that spells out how we could spend the money and how it would all play out. Um, 21 million for 21 million in excess collections right now, but we also have a, a potential of 22 million in the convention center. Mm -hmm. So, 
at some point in, in about a year, the, the uh, subcommittee feels comfortable in letting that go after we get the convention center further along. But we presented a plan that would allow all of the things that you've seen and, and heard about, the additional requests for each of the subcommittees, they are able to, to build those up to a point and that is, at the end of next year, the plan shows that a decision would have to be made between either a fifth wellness center or some additional trails. And the reason being is the, the subcommittee and the advisory board have all talked about timing on the fifth center. We've, we only have two going. We've got two more under construction. And they'd like, they've always talked about how they wanted to see the performance of the second one and, and see how that all turns out. So that is the plan that we presented to them is that at the end of next year, we could make that decision. And the reason why the, the trails is a decision then also is because there's so many trails being built with uh, Better Streets, Safer Cities, and with the bond issue, that we would have a better idea of how that was going at that time. And David, just so the record's clear, the subcommittee and the advisory board both approved this $3.5 million. That is correct. Thank you. So David, I, I still like to live in a world where a fifth senior center is possible. And, and I guess my basic question is, is, is it still possible even with approval of this today? It, it is, but the, the decision would be whether we build more trails out of MAPS 3 or whether we build the fifth wellness center. Okay. If you were to add three and a half million to senior wellness center number two, three, and four, as we're doing for this one, would a fifth senior wellness center be possible? Probably not. Ed, we haven't seen the demand, certainly in wellness number two. Uh, so what would be the purpose of expanding it if the demand for those services isn't there with its current size? Well, it's kind of like the boathouse. I mean, you, you build amenities that maybe attract more people. I mean, that was our philosophy in increasing allocations to the boathouse. I mean, and, you, you and, and, and simply because of timing, I mean, th this could be a, a MAPS-4 issue, too, that we well, we, yeah, we that's because, I mean, point. we're, we're I, talking about some, something that's happened if, I think years, years ago. Successful, and then, I wouldn't want to stop building senior wellness centers at the conclusion of MAPS-3. We could find other sources of funding to build as many as, as, as the demand uh, I'm not, places. Well, number one, MAPS-4 hasn't passed yet. I mean, there hasn't, isn't even a MAPS-4, but you have, you have, uh, the second wellness center has been open for seven months. You haven't even built the third and fourth one, so you have absolutely no idea what utilization will be used in those senior wellness centers. So I don't think you can, you can say that the demand is not there on the other ones that it is for this one. I guess the question is, why, why now? What's the, what's the rush? Why allocate $3.5 million now? Why not wait till these things that David's talking about uh, get flushed out a year from now? Because they've ran out of room. We want because I'm getting phone calls and emails um, from elderly females that are saying we need to expand these bathrooms. We need more showers. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a it's a successful project, and and, and the other thing is that um, the land. Uh, just so everyone knows, there's a developer that wants to buy the land and develop on that. And I would rather have it uh, serve as our parking lot uh, than to be developed uh, for other purposes. Could, could I make one other comment relative to that, too, uh, uh, Councilman Shadid? I, yeah. I certainly appreciate your comments. But I would also say that we're at the point where we have an absolutely great thing going. Wellness Center number one has exceeded all expectations. It is doing well. But we're at the point to where we're going to see that going the other way. We're going to have dissatisfaction. We're going to have unhappy members and everything else. It's too crowded. They can't get in to use the facilities. And uh, it, we can ruin a really good thing if we don't expand it so that all the citizens have access to it. Okay, any other questions or comments on this item? Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Is there any other item anyone wants to pull out of the consent docket? So we currently have a motion and a second for all the items on the consent docket. For a separate vote? I'm sort of expecting you to say that, but I didn't want to. <laughs> okay. All right, so item AN will be pulled out, and then we'll do a motion and a second on that. So now the motion is um, for all the items except for 
A in. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Okay, we've got a motion and a second on AN. That's the resolution approving allocation of 3.5 million uh, for the wellness center just discussed. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes one, two, three, uh, seven to one. Okay, that concludes the consent docket. We now move to the concurrence docket on page 14 of the printed agenda, item eight, uh, A through J. I would entertain a motion. We've got, we've got a motion and a second on the uh, items under the concurrence docket. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. This brings us to uh, item nine, items requiring separate votes. 9A is a, a planning case. This is ordinance on final hearing. This was recommended for denial at the planning commission. This was deferred October 9th and the 23rd. Uh, it is Ward 7. Um, is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this item? Okay. How would you like to dispose of it, Councilwoman Nice? I would like to defer. I want to get some more information. I understand that there have been some updates okay. since last. Okay. That is, that is perfectly understandable um, under the circumstances. So uh, what meeting would we maybe be looking December at? December 4th. Is is, December 4th is the next meeting. Do you want to do that or do you want to wait longer? December 4th is fine. December 4th? Okay. Second the motion. All right, so we've got a motion and a second to defer to December 4th. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That item is deferred. We've got item 9B, ordinance on final hearing relating to alcohol beverages and low point beer, et cetera. We've had this, uh, this would be the third meeting this has appeared. Your Honor, um, there is an amendment that needs to be made to this and uh, that did not get in the agenda, and the amendment is to do, it's adding to it uh, a statement that we are amending to delete section 5-9 comma small brewer sample. Okay. So that motion is for your, that is a motion to make that amendment? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's duplicative language okay. that's in the ordinance. Okay. Um, so we'd handle that first, right, Kenny? Yeah. All right, we've got a motion. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We're back on the item as amended. This, again, this is the uh, third meeting this ordinance has appeared. This relates to complying with changing state laws on alcohol. Is there any further discussion? We've had presentations on this in the past. I'd move the item. All right. We've got a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? This is on the item as amended. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Yeah, all right. So we're at C. That was deferred at the beginning of the meeting. D was also deferred at the beginning of the meeting. But item E, we need to do a, uh, an independent deferral to January 15th. I would entertain that motion. Move that item. Got a motion and a second for the deferral to January 15th. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And same story with item 9F. Move the item. Second. Got a, and by move the item, you mean move the deferral to January 15th. All right, to uh, January 15th. Yes. Sorry. We've got a motion and a second on the deferral. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes wow. unanimously. So 9F is deferred to January 15th. That brings us to 9G, Ordinance on Final Hearing, establishing a reserved parking space for the physically disabled parking on the north side of Northeast 40th, et cetera. Um, Councilwoman Nice. Uh, this is something. It's been through Traffic Commission, and uh, it is tradition for you to make the motion if you wish. <laughs> Move that. All right. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, now we have ordinance on final hearing. Amending ordinance number 25,886 by amending the description of the project for the downtown maps economic development project plan, et cetera. We've had this on many meetings at this point. This is uh, this is actually the fourth meeting yeah. we've had uh, related to it, yeah. and this is a, establishing a, a, a TIF for the American Indian Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. 
And we do have representatives here from the American Indian Cultural okay. Center. Is there any comment or discussion or questions that anybody needs to ha have? This is the uh, final consideration. I'd move the item. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, 9I, ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing December 4th and final adoption December 18th, relating to schedule of fees. Mr. Couch. Jason Fairbrush is here this morning to present this to us. Well, good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, excuse me. Yes. Yeah, so, item nine I is uh, a uh, ordinance or a proposed ordinance, a proposed ordinance change uh, for Chapter sixty schedule of fees, uh, specifically sixty two seventeen revocable permits. Um, the item on the agenda today is for introduction. We'll set a uh, public hearing for comments on December fourth and then uh, final adoption on December 18th. And the um, uh, ordinance change that we're looking at uh, is specifically for revocable permits and fees associated with uh, obtaining a revocable permit for construction along the Oklahoma City streetcar route. So um, I thought I would provide a little bit of background as to um, why we're looking at additional fees for revocable permits when it comes to construction along the streetcar route. First of all, um, for any public transportation system um, to be reliable, we have to minimize or eliminate any interruptions in service. And so just with our bus system, um, we plan to operate our streetcar system uh, during special events. Um, we're, we're confident we can coexist with special events that, go, uh, that, get, that occur downtown. Uh, we plan to operate the streetcar during all types of inclement weather. And we also will need to operate the streetcar during construction downtown. Now, the thing that is a little bit different about the streetcar system is, you know, typically when we have construction downtown, let's say utility work or something that might affect a traffic lane, well, lane closure is set up and motorists are able to detour around that construction work. Obviously, that's not the case with the streetcar, so we have to have a contingency plan in place to make sure that we can continue service but do so in a, in, in, in a manner that is safe, not only to workers, but to uh, customers of the streetcar system. So there will be occasions when construction along the streetcar route will require additional OKC streetcar staffing, again, to ensure uh, the safety of the system while the construction work occurs. So in some cases, we may need to put a flagger out on the route. And so a flagger is basically an extra person or persons that would be located in uh, like a, a work zone where the streetcar uh, route exists. And that flagger's responsibility is to control the movement of the streetcar. So they would look out for workers, construction equipment, and so forth. Um, we also, in some cases, may have to employ uh, bus bridges. This is something we ideally uh, we don't want to do. Uh, but it is a way to continue streetcar service in the event part of the streetcar route is shut down in its entirety. So how would that happen? Let's say, for example, and I'll, I'll direct you to the map. Uh, let's say, for example, we had some work in Bricktown that was occurring um, where we absolutely could not uh, operate the streetcar. Well, we still are obligated to provide that service. So what we would likely do in this case operationally, we, was, we would activate the turn back on EK Gaylord, basically cutting service off from Bricktown, still serving the central business district in Midtown, and we would use bus bridges to make the connections um, to the, to the uh, platforms in Bricktown. So we'd basically run a, a bus or along the the portion of the route that is in Bricktown. That's one example of when you would want to do a bus bridge. Again, ideally, we don't want to operate bus bridges, but there may be cases when we have to do that. And then the last, the last scenario we could run into is a complete shutdown of the overhead contact system, the electrical uh, 
uh, wires that, that feed the streetcar propulsion. Again, this is something we hopefully will very rarely, if ever, have to do, but we have to plan for it, and that's, that's exactly what we're doing. So in the event we had to shut down the overhead uh, contact system, um, we would be able to shut that down remotely from our control center, but then again, with safety being paramount, we would send people out to physically, basically, lock out the TPSS, the, the transformers essentially that feed the electricity. We would monitor the TPSS while any construction was occurring, and then we would have to have staff go about, back out to each TPSS and manually uh, activate them and then start them at the control center as well. So the idea is that construction just, re just will require additional staffing, and so what we are proposing through this amendment through this proposed um, ordinance change is to recover the costs associated with those extra uh, staff. So <clears throat> how would that work? On the next slide here, basically OKC Streetcar is included currently in the revocable permit review process. So when we have a revocable permit come through that our staff believes is going to require a flag or bus bridge or OCS shutdown, we would then charge the construction uh, company or the utility company accordingly by the rates that you see um, there on the slide. And that's just simply cost recovery for us. That is what um, Herzog Transit Service would charge OKC streetcar. So again, we're just simply recovering our costs. I think it is important to note that with this ordinance change, utility companies uh, covered by franchise agreements, they already pay for these type of fees associated with revocable permits through their fran franchise agreements. So those utilities with franchise agreements would not be subject to the uh, fees that we're proposing today. And I believe that, that wraps up my, my overview of this ordinance change, and I'm glad to take any questions. Any questions for Jason? Okay. Well, thank you. We will need a motion to introduce the ordinance for consideration. So moved. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That will have a public hearing at our next meeting and potential final adoption after that. Item 9J was deferred at the beginning of the meeting. Item stricken. stricken. I'm sorry, you're right. Stricken. Item 9K was also stricken. That brings us to 9L, collective bargaining agreement with the Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge 123, fiscal year 2018-2019, effective July 1st of 2018. Um, excited to see this on the agenda. Commend everybody for, for working towards this day, and uh, we'll continue to hopefully have a, uh, on these, on these uh, collective bargaining agreements a very communicative relationship and collaborative relationship moving forward. And uh, I would entertain a motion. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We've got 9M1, Resolution Approving Revisions to Police Policy 271 Limitations and Police Policy 272, Permission to Engage in Extra Duty Work. There's also M2, Resolution Approving Revisions to Police Policy 568, Barricaded Suspects. And I believe we may have a presentation. Chief City is here this morning to explain those to us. Okay. Okay, uh, basically on 271, the, uh, the prohibit employment, basically what we've added, we've added the words because of the sale of the legal sale of medical marijuana for extra duty jobs basically the primary thing in that change is going to prohibit officers from working at those locations where marijuana is sold it's technically a federal violation of the law and we we don't let them allow we don't allow them to work in places to serve alcohol and things like that so we are limiting that and prohibiting that so that's primarily what you see in in set in 271 and then in 568 the, the, on the barricaded subjects, the primary changes to that is to identify a barricaded subject either as criminal, because we had the word sus a suspect in there, subject, so you're adding criminal. So we may, we don't always go to a barricaded subject that's not that's that's not that's not criminal. They may not be criminal. So sometimes it's, we make a choice just to walk away because it's not criminal behavior. Uh, the other one is that we've added mental health consumer as a barricaded subject and required that a CIT or a crisis intervention team member be deployed to that barricaded subject that's suffering from mental health issues. Those are the two primary changes. Okay. I move approval of 9M1. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Any questions? Any discussion? Seeing none, um, this is for 9M1. Cast your votes. 
Passes unanimously. Now I'd move approval for 9M2, please. 9M2, any questions, discussion? Got a second? Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. This brings us to 9N, resolution approving the Regional Transit Authority of Central Oklahoma Trust Agreement and indenture with the cities of Edmond, Norman, Moore, Midwest City, and Dell City, and authorizing the mayor to execute the final document. Uh, obviously, we had a lengthy um, workshop on this very topic with COTPA last Tuesday, um, so we're hopefully all up to speed on it. Um, any discussion? I'd move approval of the item. We've got a motion and a second. Uh, we do have someone who has signed up to speak, so before we vote, um, uh, let's bring him forward. Marion Hutchison. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm Marion Hutchison, Chair of uh, OnTrack and a citizen member of the RTA Task Force, and I'm really I'm excited to be here, and uh, not really as much for myself, but uh, really for our children and our grandchildren's futures and the opportunities that regional transit will offer future generations for their uh, regional transit system and their uh, transportation options. You know, when I started working on this issue more than a decade ago, uh, I didn't have gray hair and <laughs> I didn't have a child. And my son is now 12 and one of the hopes for me is that before he graduates from college, he'll be able to get around uh, with some of us that will probably be retired by then on a regional transit system throughout the metro. Uh, you know, efforts like this take years to get to fruition, and we've certainly come a long way in the last decade. I think a lot of that is due in part to the uh, support and efforts of Oklahoma City's Council. Uh, some of who started uh, years ago and are no longer on council. Uh, certainly Mayor Cornett had a lot to do with this in leading us forward. I would like to point out uh, council, former council member Pete White, who has always been very supportive of transit issues. And of course, council member Salyer, who's not here, has been very uh, important on all of that, these, all of this work. Uh, but I think it can kind of be anticlimactic, and if you look at the small paragraph, and what we're doing today, it's really a, a somewhat historical and important moment and a very big step in where we're trying to go with this. And uh, I think you do not see uh, too many examples in the past of all the cities in this region getting together on an effort uh, to jointly collaborate on something so important. And I think it says a lot about the maturity and growth of Oklahoma City and our region as we become, you know, more of a, a peer city that, uh, that we're looking at to try to emulate. So I just want to uh, thank you for all your support and I encourage you to, to vote for this and I look forward to working with you as we continue down that path. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Marion, I just want to thank you, I mean, for the years and really decades that you've put on, spent on this. I mean, uh, just the email that we got the other day, just, I mean, the, the amount of work that you've put in is has really been project changing and I am very grateful for all your efforts. I think that being being in the only state in America where we can't use property tax for operations has really pitted all the municipalities against each other as we compete for sales tax. So to see this kind of success in regionalism is a is a big deal. And maybe maybe this extends to other things, public safety or or other uh, collaborations but this is a this is a historic moment and Thank I'm grateful for all your efforts. Councilman McAtee? Yeah, I don't know whether Marion should answer this or, or Jim you have somebody on staff but one of the things that was brought up at, at our workshop was the fact that some of the municipalities in central Oklahoma have at this point elected not to join the RTA. That's correct. And uh, in my ward uh, those are Yukon, Mustang, Bethany and War Acres, and uh, I think that's important to, to note. They do, though, have the option later on to opt back in at some point should they see that they want to be a part of it. There is a mechanism to allow that in the, in the agreement. Thank you, sir. Any further uh, discussion? It is, uh, this is, these are decades long processes. The good news is I think we've got now a decade behind us, and this is uh, a major milestone uh, along the way. 
Any further discussion? We need a motion. Oh, we don't have a motion? Okay, we've got a motion and a second. And uh, as Marion did, I certainly would want to uh, acknowledge Mayor Cornette and Meg, who I know has uh, had a previously planned trip today, but I know would have loved to have been here, but has definitely been critical in this process. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 901. I uh, don't believe we need executive session. We have a joint resolution with the uh, Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority authorizing Stacy Hawes, Felkner, and Collins, Zorn, and Wagner to represent municipal employees, Oklahoma City police officers Heather Bennett, Joseph Bush, and Gregory Bell in the case of Washington v. City of Oklahoma City. Um, do we have any? We have a motion. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? You'd like to speak on this item? I don't have a, I don't have a slip from you, but we can uh, recognize you for up to three minutes if you wouldn't Thank mind you. introducing Thank yourself. Thank you, Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast 18th Street, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73111. Ladies and gentlemen, I hear this jury. We have some incompetent, sorry excuses. Not all police officers, don't get me wrong, but these particular name individuals that you're talking about, they were responsible, for the most part, in June of 2016. I want the world to know, since we've been had it hidden up to this point, that these incompetent, sorry excuses of police officers, once again, not all, had the audacity he, to, do, to determine that I needed to be arrested for hosting a Juneteenth celebration at Ralph Ellison Library. Now, everybody knows Michael Washington. No one in this audience today or any newspaper, any business agency can say that I was ever a threat to anyone. And I'm going to be profoundly myself, though, 110 percent. Brother, who likes it? Ain't that right now? Now, these officers certainly need to be held accountable for violating my Constitution and civil rights. And you better doggone believe it, sir. No, I'm not trying to scream at you. I'm just a little bit antsy today because of that name, those names ringing a bell to something so uniquely close to my heart. Now then, having said that, we definitely need these officers to be held accountable and any other officer who thinks they can violate the Constitution and civil rights of a normal, law-abiding, decent citizen who has the love of his and compassion for his community at heart. And not only heart in his community, but in the communities at large. These people need to be held accountable, sir. And if the roles were reversed, you wouldn't have to ask twice for Michael Washington to do the right thing for you. So let's hold these people accountable and y'all pay me for what they owe me. Have a good day. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9P, enter into executive session on advice of the municipal councilor to receive confidential communications regarding the case of LSV, City of Oklahoma City. Move the item into executive session. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We will handle that at the end of the other business as well as the earlier executive session items we already approved. 9Q, enter into executive session on advice of the municipal councilor to receive confidential communications regarding the case of uh, Mendel and Miller v. City of Oklahoma City. Move the item into executive session. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, catch your votes. Passes unanimously. 9R, enter into executive session on advice of the municipal councilor to receive confidential communications concerning the case of OKC versus AFSCME. Move the item into executive session. Uh, got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9S, enter into executive session on advice of the municipal councilor to receive confidential communications regarding the recent arbitration decision between City of OKC and International Association of Firefighters. Move the item into executive session. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All of those executive sessions we will handle at the end of our other business. 9T1, claims recommended for denial. I don't believe we need executive session. We have items A through E. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? On items, uh, claims recommended for denial? Yes, sir. Okay, please come forward. You wouldn't mind uh, stating your name and address and, and maybe which item you're speaking in reference to. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Richardson. It's item C. Mm -hmm. uh, on the claim, uh, I had severe damage uh, to my house 
Um, and I have submitted all the paperwork that I had at that time. Um, and it's been recommended for denial. Uh, I just wanted to appeal that decision, basically, is what I'm doing. Uh, during that time, uh, I received a letter from the city which says that there was no prior knowledge of anything that was wrong with the sewer system. Uh, I actually have done repairs on that particular house back at the first part of 2017 for the same incident. I was not aware that I needed to inform anyone of what could have been a sewer problem at that time. Um, I still have not been able to get those items fixed. Um, and I was hoping that, uh, I guess, basically throw myself on the mercy of the council to see if we could reconsider uh, the denial. It's probably uh, just an automatic thing as far as what I was concerned with. Uh, usually just recommend a denial, you know, kind of like Social Security, you know, first time you apply. So <clears throat> that's the only reason I'm here, to see if we yeah, can uh, sure. uh, reconsider the denial. Well, maybe we would need a little background. Can he? Um... Yes. We have Tina. Excuse me. We have Tina here, too, but I believe this one is just one where we checked the city records for the last five years, and there, there was no notice of any type of prob problem with this particular line in Oklahoma case law is that you have to have prior notice. Okay. So what's your, what's your counter to that issue? Well, my counter to that is that um, I did have an incident in 2017. Like I said, I was not aware that I needed to uh, inform the city of anything. Um, <clears throat> but I will say this, uh, after my incident, uh, the city sewage line people were out there every day for about a week working so obviously the there had to have been a problem. no after this oh. this major incident that i just had yeah so obviously it was something that they needed to fix i watched them out there for five days after that right well so but kenny without notice it's we can't fix it and you're saying case law right. yes uh we have to have notice that there's a problem on the line and then we have a we have, then we have a duty to abate, abate it within a reasonable time. Which is what we did when we found out about the second incident. Correct. So, example, if this happened to you six months from now, we probably, yes. in all likelihood, would, would approve the claim because we did have notice and we... Yes, absolutely. I mean, the only thing we could do to help him is if review the paperwork and if there was some paperwork that showed that we knew before his problem. That's why the city subsequently went out there. Uh, and that may just be a review of the paperwork, and that may have already occurred. But otherwise, uh, we've got to have some notice. Yeah. Mr. Richardson, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. So can you give us a little bit more detail about the problem that occurred in 2017? Was there a... Uh... Uh, in 2017, um, I had the same type of backup uh, through the toilets yes, and sir. also in the tubs. Uh, at that time, uh, I just claimed it through my insurance. Uh, this particular time, I've had some struggles. Right. Uh, I have a wife that's at home that's sick. A lot of medical bills. Insurance had lapsed. Right. Stuck out there. Well, may I ask you, so did the problem occur, like, within your private line or the city's? Meeting? It was, it, I called a plumber out. Yes. who informed me that it, was a, that it was the city main. He's actually the one to call the city at that time. Uh, what I had, and I think they took pictures when they came out. I have some on my phone. I have four restrooms in my house. All four of them backed up. I mean, we were sitting there about 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Next thing you know, just all this water just started bubbling up. Yes, sir. So did you just say that when you had your incident in 2017, mm -hmm. you hired a plumber and you thought that the plumber had notified the city at that no, no, time? No, no, oh. no. Uh, this time, okay. the plumber notified the city from He came right. out, he looked at the backyard, Yes. He took the cap off, Right. he saw it, he said, no, this is the main, okay. this is the city line. But you don't allege that in 2017, in the first incident, that you or a plumber or anyone contacted the city? No, sir, I did not. Okay. I, d I was not aware that I needed to contact anyone. I just, I called my insurance at that time. And they didn't 
try to make a claim with the city or anything? No, I don't believe they did. They just paid it. Okay. Did you have anything to add, Tina? Well, what we do when we get these claims is, is ask utilities for anything that's happened on that line segment for five years historically. Nothing showed up on this one. If we'd been told last year that they'd had one, then that may have served as notice probably, would have served on those on this one. But since nobody called, we didn't have any notice. That's just not something that's common knowledge. I don't believe that, you know, you have a problem like that. You usually don't just call the city. You just call your plumber and you call your insurance and it's taken care of. I didn't know that, uh, I mean, I'm just now finding out through this process that maybe I should have let the city know back in 2017. But I did not. I didn't know that. One thing the city could do if they wanted to would be to put it on the, the website if you have a sewer backup to notify the city. And mm -hmm. that's, that's a possibility. Okay. Any further uh, questions or discussion specifically on Mr. Richardson? Okay. Just, <clears throat> just one. So if the insurance did try to file a claim against the city, therefore giving us notification in 2017, that would have showed up not with utilities but with legal, correct? Uh, yes, it would have showed up with us and also, yeah, absolutely. And five years is the extent of our records. That's how long the records are kept. So we check all the records that are that so, we have. So you do check your records as long with utilities, is that correct? Did you check our record? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Richardson. Thank you. Um, I don't know that we have a motion on this item yet. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Um, this would uh, deny all claims T through E. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Uh, passes unanimously. <clears throat> Mr. Richardson, I do want to thank you for coming down, and we certainly have sympathy for your situation. Our hands are a little bit tied by the law, but thank you. Um, we have 10A1 claims recommended for approval. Uh, we do not need executive session, to my knowledge. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on claims recommended for approval? Move the items for approval. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the council? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to items from council. Uh, we'll start with you. I want to speak just for a minute about um, kind of begin a dialogue about ethics commissions, which we talked about yesterday. We um, interviewed city manager candidates yesterday in the executive session, so I don't want to talk about that in, in specifics. But in general, there was something I noticed. My, my question was, you know, how, how would you handle if, um, if there was corruption, how, if there was corruption among a member of council or the mayor? And it was interesting because the internal candidates that we interviewed all said, well, I'd go to this municipal council, or the, they would go to the city auditor, I, go to that is, person. Is it appropriate to share? I, I, I'm totally with you on this. Speaking in general. <laughs> but you're sharing executive session details. Is that? It's not illegal. It's not illegal. OK. Not illegal. Uh, okay. I just. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so the, and the, the, this is the only point, is that all the external candidates were like, well, I'd go to an ethics, I'd use an ethics commission, or do you have an ethics commission? Or it was all like going to an external source. I just thought that was a, an interesting dichot or a contrast there. So it caused me to, to read last night and I started looking at, at how many cities have ethics commissions. I mean, you, I don't want to be an outlier. So you start plugging them in. City of Dallas Ethics Commission, they've got one. Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, T Tulsa. I mean, every city around us. So then you start going out to the rest of the country. I mean, I'm not sure which country, which cities don't have ethics commissions, but I can see that almost all the large cities I'm looking up have them. So now I'm wondering, how much of an outlier are we? Are we the largest city in America without an ethics commission? Because that's the way it looks to me on my preliminary kind of Googling. I mean, I haven't done a detailed search, and I'd ask for help to find out exactly you know, which cities have ethics commissions and which don't. Are we, the, are we an outlier? There's nothing wrong with being an outlier, right? Every trailblazer is an outlier. But you have to have a reason 
why you're an outlier. You have to have some alternative to what everybody else is doing. If we, if we have a system here that our city auditor is going to make these investigations as opposed to ethics commissions, which it appears that most of the rest of the cities in America are doing, fine, but I don't, the city auditor answers to us as a council of mayors, so I don't understand how he could investigate us. He has lots of things going on, and these things, you know, drop without any notice, so I don't understand that that office would necessarily be the best. There are lots of best practices, just kind of reading about how to establish these things, these ethics commissions. A lot of them, you know, you appoint seven, eight individuals, so it's not just one individual, like a city auditor in charge of it. It's a, it's a panel of people who have the power to do these investigations and, and offer an opinion. Sometimes they have subpoena power, sometimes they don't. Um, and then they can, and then, and then you've got this independent body, but, um, you know, there was, there was talk about, well, we're, we're a medium-sized city becoming a large city. We're, we're a big league city. But big league cities, every single one, either has corruption or they have allegations of corruption. You might have allegations of corruption that are unfounded. Well, you have to have a vehicle to disprove those unfounded allegations. Or you have to have a vehicle to investigate it, legitimate things of corruption. But every single city will have that... that large cities in America, you're going to have some corruption. There's just too much money, too much conflicts of interest. Every city has it, every single one. So we have to anticipate uh, without, we have to anticipate that that is an issue that this city will have to be able to process in the years and decades ahead. Yeah. Let's do more than a Google search, maybe get staff put something together, make a presentation to us. That's what I'm asking Look at for. the role of the, of the city auditor. We better understand that uh, at, a, at a future meeting. That, that's exactly what I'm asking for. We'd we'll be happy to do that. OK. We've got an issue with the, the police now. And we're trying to figure out who's going to do that. We've got, you know, we've got some, we've had some issues over the past few years. I, I think there's a real need to do that now. Uh, and so I, I, that's what I'm asking for. It's just a, a formal research and presentation to us about what our options are going forward. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Councilman McAtee. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. I'd also like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And uh, thank you to all the members of the council, mayor, uh, and staff for your welcome for my first day yesterday. That was all day yesterday. <laughs> Uh, but it has been exciting thus far, and I'm looking forward to continuing to serve and progress Ward 7 as well as o the city of Oklahoma City. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Safe travels to everyone. Very good. Well, that brings us to item uh, 12, city manager reports, and we have a presentation here uh, at 12A. We do. We have a presentation this morning on uphold high standards for all city services. And I think Doug's going to kick us off, and then Christy's going to oh. come. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. Doug Dowler, Budget Director. And uh, we try to bring, bring periodic updates on the priorities that were adopted by Council a couple of years ago. And this uh, morning, we're going to be talking about uh, upholding high uh, standards for all city services. This was a new priority that was added a couple of years ago. And so we've got presentations from uh, several different departments and kind of, again, looking at overall service. So, yes, Christy Yeager will uh, start us off looking at some of those uh, measures uh, that, that relate to overall city services. Good morning. I got a little excited there. Um, my name is Christy Yeager. I'm the Public Information Officer. And um, I'm here to talk to you about perceptions residents have about city services and about how people, residents, get information about city government. Okay, let's take a look at our council priorities and how we're doing with the quality of services provided by the city. According to this year's citizen survey, the city ranked well, 17% above the national average for large cities in the U.S. In 2017, 57% of residents surveyed report they were satisfied or very satisfied with the quality of service city departments provided to them. That number increased 5% in 2018 to 62%. So we're doing pretty well there. Providing a timely, meaningful response is important to the city's credibility. 
So the Action Center monitors how quickly service requests are responded to by city departments. Last year, city departments, primarily the Parks Department, Public Works, and um, Development Services responded to 96% of their service requests within 10 days. This means we met our target for the year. As you can see by the graph, over the last three years, the majority of service requests were responded to by departments in a timely manner, which is in the 95 to 96% mark. On behalf of the Action Center, I'd like to thank all of the employees who helped meet our commitment to residents and help us uphold these high standards. Uh, just a side note, um, in 2007, 17, the Action Center uh, received about 72,000 calls. So we've been very busy. So next, let's talk about how residents report getting information about the city. According to the Citizen Survey, 67% of people say the water bill is their number one way to get information about us. This is not a surprise at all to us. It's been our number one resource for um, many years, ever since we started the Citizen Survey. Our number two resource is television news at 63%. Number three is the website, okc.gov, at 40%. Number four is newspapers at 31%. And finally, at the number five spot is social media. And that's 27% right now. Only 6% of residents said they get information from Channel 20, which is very different. That's changed over the last 20 years in a big way. And that's not to say people aren't watching city council meetings or they're not watching our videos. Um, they're just doing it on different devices. They're not doing it through a TV. They're doing it on their mobile device, typically. Okay, social media. The Public Information and Marketing Office measures the number of social media interactions from the city's flagship accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. The gray bar is our target of 2,100 social media interactions. We had 2,940 interactions in fiscal year 2018. Many of our posts involved communication around Better Street, Safer City. We answered a lot of resident questions about that proposal prior to the vote. This is a busy slide. Now I'm going to focus on our social media strategy led by our communications and marketing manager, Zach Nash. The city manages 63 different social media accounts. And when I refer to social media, I'm talking primarily about Facebook, Twitter, Nextdoor, Instagram, and YouTube. Employees who have social media training in different city departments are empowered to post content to their social media accounts, which are monitored daily by Zach and our staff writer, Michael Kimball. The city's flagship account at City of OKC has more than 30,000 followers on Facebook and 90,000 on Twitter. We can also reach about 95,000 people um, with one push notification through Nextdoor. It's a pretty powerful tool for us. In fiscal year 2018, we had almost 3,000 social media interactions. That includes posts and responses. Police had more than, has more than 142,000 Facebook followers and 46,000 Twitter followers. So they're by far uh, the most followed social media account that the city has. And they do a great job managing that. Animal Welfare has 38,000 followers on Facebook. And the Fire Department has 29,500 Facebook fo followers and more than 11,000 Twitter followers. Our office loves social media for five reasons. One, it allows us to communicate directly with residents in real time. Two, social media helps us maximize awareness and public engagement. Three, it makes it easy for residents to ask questions and communicate their concerns. Four, it helps us find and correct misinformation. And five, it's free, at least for now. The post on the screen is an example of how we successfully manage the social media feeds for a positive outcome. A resident in an unnamed ward recently stated on Nextdoor that MAPS has done nothing for her neighborhood, just raised taxes and made downtown what sounds to be a theme park. Michael Kimball responded, 
Michael Kimball responded with a lengthy post. Instead of reading the whole thing that he wrote up there, I'll just paraphrase what he wrote. There's a $3.9 million street enhancement project that includes Northwest 19th Street in your neighborhood and a $1.5 million street enhancement project on the east side of your neighborhood. There's also an enhancement project planned for Northwest 16th Street as a part of Better Street Safer City. Those projects will provide a better connection to the MAPS 3 Will Rogers Trail just east of your neighborhood. Michael then continues to go on about how the 2007 bond program helped the area. Our same day, even killed response explained the improvements made in the neighborhood, what else was planned, and he provided a link to more information at, on our website. The resident thanked us for the answer and for listening to her concerns. For those of you using social media, you know how important videos are. They're the best way to create engagement on social media platforms, and they can be incredibly effective for government communications. According to social media today, 500 million people watch videos on Facebook every day, and over half of all of our video content is viewed on a mobile device. Because video content is so important, we recently hired another digital media producer. His name is Greg Singleton, and he joins Francis Landers. So you'll be meeting him soon. So having said all that, social media isn't the end-all be-all. It's just one of the many strategies in the city's communication toolbox. As a city, we're called to communicate with diverse populations. So there'll always be a need for many types of communications tools, ranging from face-to-face -face interaction and news releases to signage and media events. Traditional media continues to be an important way to reach our residents as well. Thanks for your time. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Christy, for all you do. Next up, Debbie Miller with Public Works. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Debbie Miller, Assistant Director of Public Works, and I'm here to update you on Public Works measure for city services. Um, we have one measure, it's percent of potholes repairs completed within three business days of requested. Um, as we know, quality of city streets has been important to the residents in the citizen survey, and we are working to meet this requirement. Um, if you go to the next slide, it shows our it's a performance indicator of the potholes of the residents who have called in through the Action Center and we've issued work orders on. This is a percentage of, sorry, this actually is the percentage we are achieving. Our goal is 80%. As you can see in 2017, we did get close to that. We have slightly fallen off. We have had some issues with workforce availability and with um, equipment repairs, we have a plan that we're working to get that working. We have budgeted 13 crews for pothole repairs. Now this slide shows the citizens who have called in, the residents who have called in with pothole requests through the Action Center. As you can see, in 2015, the uh, year was very wet. We had numerous high-frequency storms. Uh, which caused many potholes. Um, it has slightly gone down, and we expect it to continue to reduce with our Better Streets, Safer Cities program. Um, we are fixing the worst streets first, so that should hopefully reduce our pothole requests. The next slide shows our full scope of pothole repairs. Um, even though on the previous slide the citizen re uh, resident requests were 3,200, here you show that in 2018, we actually had almost 54,000 potholes that we repaired. So as staff goes out and they are working on the potholes, they don't just repair one. They try to get everything that's in that area and get it repaired. And I will answer any questions. I remember when I first came on the council, we were repairing about 80,000 plus a year, and so that number is trending down. Correct? Yes, it is. And that's a good thing. It is a good thing. And we're hoping it will continue to reduce. Thank you. We're not going to fix quite as quickly as we'd like to. And, and quite frankly, because of the employment or the unemployment level, 
is, is so low, we're having a little bit of a trouble in, in, in the streets department getting, getting qualified people into, to, with CDLs to, to uh, yes, build those. Yes, so we're, we're working on that and we're, we're, we're actively pursuing to, to get those people hired back up. But we do have a number of vacancies right now in the street department that we're working to fill. That's right. We, we have a plan we're working on. Um, what, how about the CPI? Is it still trending up? The Correct. PCI is still trending yeah, up. I think we're at 66, and we're hoping with the Better Street Safer Cities that it will um, increase quite a bit this next year. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have utilities. Chris Browning is here. Good morning. Chris Browning, Utilities Director. The Utilities Department, generally speaking, has the responsibility to provide safe drinking water, uh, adequate water supply for fire protection, safe wastewater disposal, and trash collection service to customers throughout the city. So, so with that said, we provide service to every single person in Oklahoma City every single day. So we do have a big job. So today I want to cover uh, a number of performance measures, uh, customer service, water, waste, water, solid waste, and then I'd like to summarize with the uh, citizen survey that you all received uh, a couple of months ago and just kind of highlight one part of that. So in customer service, our goal is to answer calls within 30, 30 seconds, and our, our target goal is, is 90% of the time. So the call center receives approximately a half a million calls a year. Um, with the 90% uh, uh, target goal of answering the calls within 30 seconds, that's, we've actually increased that measure this year. It was 80%. But we implemented some process improvements and we upgraded our technology. And so with those two things alone, we've actually uh, been able to increase our performance level to nearly what our target goal is for this year. Uh, we, we do have some vacancies that after we fill them, we should be able to exceed that target goal so that we can get people uh, on the phone quicker so that they're not on hold. Uh, that's a very, very important measure for us. So with water, um, when we have a water emergency, response is critical. We need to have somebody go out and, and start working on the mitigation plan immediately. So our goal is to respond to emergencies within uh, one hour. That means that we have people on site within one hour when we, when we get notified that there's a water main break. In fiscal year uh, 2018, we had a, a different measure. We were measuring repair time, and, and repair uh, time is pretty dynamic. It depends on the size of the main and, and the nature of the problem. So we thought a better metric would be our response to begin the work on the emergency. And to put it in perspective, when I first got here, in 2016, we had a 72-inch water main break uh, at the Draper water treatment plant. Now, 72-inch water main. When that one broke, it, it was such a large volume of water leaving the pipe that it drained the plant. Well, within six hours, we were back up and running, even with a 72-inch main. So our response is pretty, pretty good. Um, so our, what, we, what we would like to do is respond to every single main break within one hour of notice and as you can see from the chart here, uh, we are exceeding our goal. We're at 96% of the time. On the wastewater, um, again, we changed our response time, the metric. Um, we would like to respond to sewer emergencies within one hour. In 2018, the metric was two hours. We didn't think that was good enough. We said, no, if we have a sewer emergency, we need to be out there mitigating the problem within one hour. So we changed protocols, we changed the way we respond to the calls, and so um, we're, we're not quite where we want to be. We're getting close, and, and a lot of that, um, uh, the reason why we're not as, as good at responding to the wastewater calls is the water is a staffing challenge right now. We have a number of vacancies, but we're filling those, and we should be able to meet or exceed our goal uh, very soon. Uh, the reason why we have uh, decreased the response time uh, is because we have implemented uh, standard protocols and operating procedures to enable us to do a better job to respond to the calls. For solid waste management, uh, our goal is to be out of the neighborhood by 5 o'clock. 
have all the trash picked up and, and out of the neighborhood by 5 o'clock. We're, uh, we're doing pretty good. When you look at this, uh, this graph, we're at 100% of the time. And that's not, not just our staff, but that's our waste management uh, contractor as well. This year, if you recall, we completed a reroute of the whole trash system, and we did that to improve the efficiency of the way we pick up the trash. So that enables us to get in and get out before people get home. When they get home, they want to roll that can up to the house. They don't want to wait on it to be emptied later on. So our goal is to, to get it done, and we are. Um, in addition to the reroute, we've improved some of the trash collection uh, um, protocols and, and increased our efficiency in that regard as well. Go ahead. So when you look at the, the, the citizen survey, um, our trash collection service is, is uh, pretty satisfactory, according to everybody in Oklahoma City. We're at 91% satisfaction rating. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty strong, considering uh, a lot of the utility ratings are in the 60 and 70 percentile range. We're at 91%. Um, when you look at the water service, we're not where we want to be. We're at 78 percent, so we're doing a couple of things to improve the, the, the customer satisfaction. First, uh, we're working on an MOU with the uh, Public Works Department to, to repair the streets quicker. When we have a main break and we have to dig up the street, we want it, we want it back in service as quickly as possible. Secondly, we've outsourced the driveway, sidewalk, landscaping, and irrigation repair services, so we get a better response there as well. We don't have to worry about uh, backlogs. We have contractors on board that will help us repair those, um, those items in people's yards so they don't have to be concerned with the, with the damage for a prolonged period of time. And the last thing, we uh, develop protocols to clean the streets, driveways, and sidewalks immediately after we repair so that people aren't driving through mud for days on, on end until everything gets fixed. So we've done those things, and hopefully uh, with, with those changes in the way we're doing business in water, we'll get a higher customer satisfaction rating next year. So finally, when you look at this slide, we're doing pretty good. And we're comparing ourselves, all of, all of our services uh, across the U.S., even with large cities, we're well beyond the norm. And so this slide kind of tells the story about how utilities provide services to the, uh, to the citizens we serve here in Oklahoma City. And with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Good job, good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, on the agenda, we also have a uh, development impact fees report, and it's uh, good information on what we've accomplished so far in impact fees. I do want to point out there's an error in the last line of the report. It says revenue from the benefit area will be used to, and it should say, provide earthwork and construction uh, to the land in the amount of $817,000. The, the, the land was donated to us. We're using that money to, to do earthwork in, in, in that area. So I want to clarify that. Thank you. Um, also have on our list the hotel collections report and the sales tax report. The sales tax report for this month is down a little bit, but I think the key number to take a look at is, is that as we're through now five months of the fiscal year, we're within a percent of our projections. We're at nine tenths of a percent over. So even though it was down a little bit in November, we're still in really good shape going forward for the fiscal year. And then I do want to point out, this may or may not be my last meeting. And I'll, let me explain that to you. It's, it's, it's all, all on you. Uh, if you choose a new city manager later today uh, that's internal, I assume they will be leading the council meetings uh, henceforth. If you do not make a decision today, I will come back and, and be here. Mayor Holt has asked that I come back to the end of the year to, to be at, at the city council meetings. Or if you hire someone today that might be not internal, that would take some time to transition, I would be here to, to continue to uh, be here to lay council meetings through, again, the remainder of the year. So I, I do really want to just take a second to, to thank the council for all the support you provided for the city. We have a unique council uh, that is always focused on moving the city forward. And your professional, your professionalism, your intelligence, your you, the, the way you conduct business and the support you've given not only me but, but the staff of the city is, is just been spectacular. 
And I can't thank you enough for uh, what we've been able to accomplish. And it's uh, city manager time, so there cannot be a response by council at this time. So thank you. <laughs> I think, personally speaking for me, we're going to have, and we're going to create opportunities to say some nice things about you. So I, I don't necessarily, if people want to weigh in now, that's fine. But I, I, I assure you we will have copious amounts of positive things to say <laughs> at the appropriate time. But, but if this is, in fact, your final council meeting, and I don't know. <laughs> We have, we'll see, but if it is, of course, the, the history of that is certainly noted, and we are, of course, very, very grateful for your service. Thank you. Okay. All right. That concludes um, <clears throat> city manager reports. That brings us to the last page of your printed agenda, item 13, citizens to be heard, and uh, we've got a few, and we will uh, basically take them as, as they signed up, and that starts with Mark Nelson. And Mark, I, I, I don't presume this is what you're here to talk about, but I do want to say since I have you, um, my um, appreciation for uh, your work and John George's work on the previously approved um, item uh, regarding the, the collective bargaining agreement and look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Mayor. Those feelings are very mutual um, to the entire council and congratulations, Councilor, on your election. I'm Mark Nelson. Uh, I live in Ward 8. I'm here today on behalf of the 1,050 plus FOP members. Um, I'm here to address a very specific issue. Our address is 1624 South Agnew. We have a very specific request, and it's not lost on me or us the uncomfortable, excuse me, the uncomfortableness of this situation or the position. We have tried uh, to address it in a different manner, but we kind of feel like we're out of options. We feel like we don't have anything left on the table other than to address you all as a council of Oklahoma City and uh, our city and elected leaders. And I can't believe or refuse to believe that amongst you a solution can't be found to address this. I know that you're each aware and have received a copy of the ethics complaint that was filed by our four deputy chiefs who are also members of the Fraternal Order of Police. I will not get into the details of that complaint other than to mention the specifics of claiming, excuse me, the very specifics of retaliation or threats of retaliation and intimidation by our police chief toward those four deputy chiefs. I know, Mayor, you and the council have very limited authority and scope over your ability to be involved in personnel decisions. Um, certainly not an expert, but aware of the different levels of city government and how these things work and what your options are. Uh, frankly, the response at certain levels of government isn't necessarily shocking, but it's mind-boggling at how this has been handled. Um, the What's at the core of these allegations and the lack of fair and equal treatment to every member of this department, it's tearing at the very fabric that holds us together. It really, really is. And we've shared some of those thoughts previously, um, but this, this is kind of the icing on the cake. Officers are routinely placed on administrative leave for a number of things. Officer-involved shootings uh, that within hours, if not minutes, can be determined, be determined almost 100 percent that they're justified because of transparency and other, other issues, they're left on administrative leave for weeks and months. Um, complaints where allegations are very quickly determined to be false and, and not, have no bearing whatsoever, no foundation, officers are left on administrative leave because we want to have transparency. We want to make sure that the citizens see that we don't jump to conclusions and that we handle these things with seriousness. Officers have been placed on admin leave for improper running of a vehicle tag, for failing to report a vehicle accident. We have an officer who's been on administrative leave for six months because he didn't properly book property into the property room. He's still on administrative leave. The accusations levied by the four uh, to five highest ranking members of this department um, that are handpicked, it really commands and demands the highest consideration be given and therefore consistent and equal treatment of every single officer on the police department. If four officers made similar type claims of an immediate supervisor, there is no way that supervisor would be left to supervise them. It wouldn't happen. Matter of fact, we have an officer who had a complaint filed against them who was moved so that they wouldn't be over them. We have a major who was moved and demoted because there was concerns of his ability to supervise. He was moved to a position where he, he supervised far fewer people than prior to his demotion. So this, this position that we're taking isn't new. Um, 
I'll spare you any further examples, but I'll sum it up in this. The FOP and our membership uh, have worked unbelievably hard, and I, I hope that's not lost on you, to help the advancement not only of the department but of the city. The recent addition of 130 officers and the continued hiring of them we're 100 percent in favor of. This isn't an issue about overtime pay. It's not an issue about back pay. This is an issue about possible retaliation, intimidation, and how certain people are held to a different standard. This different standard isn't fair. It isn't right. All members of the police department should be treated the same. We're here today to ask of you to do what's in your power to ensure that each officer who puts on a badge, a gun, school officers, ones that take calls, detectives, undercover officers, you name it, that they're all treated with the same level of treatment equally and fairly across the board. I appreciate your time, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I think I'll just say, um, I know you're aware of the, and you've referenced them, the limitations that the elected officials of Oklahoma City have um, in regards to personnel matters, but that doesn't mean we don't care about this issue, and I'm sure conversations will continue, and we certainly heard you today, so thank you. Okay, uh, John Albert Pettis. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I have a couple of questions. My address is 1332 Northeast 54th Street, Oklahoma City, 73111. At the last city council meeting, the council approved the award of the architect and engineering contract for the third MAPS Senior Citizens uh, Wellness Center. My question is, has that location been determined of where it's going to be built? On the agenda item, it said that it would be built on and near Northeast 23rd Street and Martin Luther King. My second question is, had the location been determined? I'll put a little light on that. Uh, the operator of that facility is Langston University. And Langston University, along with city staff, are evaluating sites. And they are evaluating some sites near 23rd and Martin Luther King. A final location has not been identified. Who will determine that site? Based upon uh, input from Langston University, again, the operator of that site, and city staff, we will make a recommendation to the MAPS 3 subcommittee, which will go, or to the uh, subcommittee, which will go to the MAPS 3 board, and ultimately to the city council. Okay, do you know the timeline for that? Not offhand, not, not, not a firm timeline, but we are making progress at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pettis. Ronnie Kirk. My name is Ronnie Kirk from 2328 North Missouri from Ward 7. I come now on behalf of my family. My sister-in-law, she's Mexican. My niece and nephew are Mexican. I'm the godfather of some kids from El Salvador. My best friend is Pete Pinon here in Oklahoma City. I'm a godfather of Maria Vargas here in Oklahoma City. With the 7,000 Mexicans headed for the Oklahoma, headed for the borders, the United States border, the United States have a 30-day notice that they are coming, 7,000 people. Mr. Holt, I listened to your comment when they had the massacre in Pennsylvania at the synagogue. Donald Trump said, have the, the rabbis give them a handgun. Uh, 
armor with the handgun. So he's sending 15,000 troops to protect the borders of the United States. Give him a handgun instead of an AR-15. We already know there's 7,000 people coming. Mexicans, if you watch those CBS and ABC uh, news special they're showing, it's showing all women and kids on this front line. All women and kids. So if you got a 30-day notice that they're coming, send the military down with handguns instead of all with AR-15. Because once they start shooting, all of that, all the, if 7,000 people are coming, only about 1,000 of them is men. The rest of them is the women with all these kids. And you're going to have more kids and women killed than Hitler did. So half, I'm speaking to y'all because y'all represent me. Y'all supposed to be speaking for me and my family, which are part Mexican. I'm speaking for them. They all march and they want freedom just to be free and live. So, yes, sir, thank you. But since y'all represent me, I want y'all to speak for me and my Mexican family. I'm in the military with a handgun instead of AR 15s. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you, Council. Michael Washington. 2900 Northeast 18th Street. New City Councilwoman Nikki Nice. We would hope that you know do your duty and position as city councilwoman to be nice in any respect when it comes to elevating and improving the northeast side of Oklahoma City. This is not a radio personality show, which again I'm sure you know of, and I believe that maybe the best person is in position to handle that duty as far as uh, increasing and uh, motivating the northeast side of Oklahoma City. And you can bet one thing, if you got an issue and need some help, ain't no question in your mind, everybody knows the love I have for my community over there. So we would hope that you not be afraid to think about what your colleagues might think or who you may affect, because it is the constituents who said more than 16,000 say you need to be where you are today, and I support that wholeheartedly. And in having said that, I'll wrap it up and say, well, congratulations to that. Now then, I'll not pick it back on these officers back here statement regarding the chief. I'm sure they can handle their own business. But what I will real like to say before I can close here is that I do not agree with the city council approving a resolution to adopt, uh, allow this lady named Stacy House Faulkner to represent these perpetrators who again went out of their way. I guess they thought they were going to hamper or damper Mr. Michael Washington's ability to be effective. Even the one day I spent in jail, let me tell y'all something. I do not appreciate it. And you know what? I feel like I'm almost like Clara Lupa, who was arrested more than 25 times for standing up for freedom, justice, and equality. Well, y'all can believe me. I mimic her to stand here today. And I feel so greatly approved and so greatly filled, so warm in knowing that she's smiling down saying, Michael, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now let me ask you, did these officers put in their formal uh, request? to be uh, represented by the city council? I'd like to know that. I have a right to, uh, according to the transparency laws of the state of Oklahoma. And i also like to know if, in fact, y'all will be paying this attorney, which I'm sure you will. She's not working on her own because she does have a family, I believe, and maybe a car payment to make. I'd like to know how much money she's going to be given to be doing that. And again, that's an Open, open Records Act. We'll be able to find that out. And also, to it states here on your second paragraph that y'all uh, wrote up, is that uh, you wanted to have a clandestine communication going on. Well, sirs and ladies and gentlemen, 
How in the world would you want to continue to have clandestine meetings with this attorney when in fact in reality that is violating the very fiber for which unity in our community is all about? Transparency in our government. In other words, this that you have no right because these are public servants who are accused of violating the constitution and civil rights of a man who stands greatly on his principles and who refuse to lie down. Mr. Washington, you're just over three minutes if you could wrap it up. I will, sir. Thank you so much. And in closing here, I would like the city council to reconsider that, and I will be submitting a, an objection to these officers. They should be held accountable, and the representative they should pay their own legal fees. Thank you all very much. And again, outstanding today, and I must leave on that note. Thank you all very much for entertaining me. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other citizens who wish to be heard? Seeing none, uh, that concludes that item. We will now head into executive session for the items previously voted on, and we will return.
We are back from executive session, and we, the council will, meeting will stand in recess until 12.45 p.m. today.
Okay, we are back from recess and are now convening again our city council meeting. We're going to go back to item 3E1. This is a resolution appointing a new city manager for the city of Oklahoma City, establishing an annual salary, setting an effective date, and providing for certain benefits and payments in addition to salary. Um, I want to say that we had so many great candidates, internal and external, that applied. We enjoyed our conversations. Um, you know, I, I think I speak for everybody when I say this. We enjoyed our conversations yesterday immensely and feel really blessed to have such great internal people working here in our city and to have had the opportunity to, to glean some knowledge um, from some excellent city management professionals from around the country. Ultimately, the candidate that we have chosen or will choose potentially here in a few minutes with uh, consideration of a resolution you know, really rises above in, in three ways that I would characterize. One is, um, you know, financial management. Um, if you take care of the financial resources of our city, it kind of makes everything else possible. A second one is a high character, high ethical standard. And if you avoid scandal, that also makes a lot of other things possible in our city. Um, and then finally, I felt as if this candidate, um, and I think a lot of us did, brings a great management style um, to the organization and will um, we'll have a very collaborative um, approach um, that we think will be well received. You know, the, the one thing, among others, but one thing that the, that the city manager has exclusive pur purview over uh, is personnel. And, uh, and that's something we can't help that person with. They have to manage it themselves. And we have a high level of confidence um, that this candidate will, will do that very well and uh, will be very well received uh, by our team here at the city. So with that, I would uh, ask um, Councilman McAtee to make a motion. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to make the following motion. And whereas the Council desires to make the appointment of Craig Freeman to the Office of City Manager effective January 2nd, 2019, at an annual salary of $245,000. And whereas he we also receive an annual allowance, car allowance of $7,000, appointment effective 501 on January 2nd, 2019. I, I need a witness. Can you read that whereas again? Yes. I just want to clear my conscience, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to save some money. That's what the new guy is supposed to have. Yes, Councilman I, McAtee driving a hard bargain there, but <laughs> but uh, would you like to amend again. the salary? Let's start over again. Okay, okay right? fine. Good things are worth saying. Whereas the council, that's you guys and gals. <laughs> whereas the council desires to make the appointment of Craig Freeman to the office of city manager, effective January 2nd, 2019, at an annual salary of $248,000. And whereas, I uh, would also like to make a car allowance of $7,000 per year, both being effective 5.01 p.m. on January 2nd, 2019. Okay, motion, do we have a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? Okay. Um, well, with that, we have a motion and a second uh, to appoint Craig Freeman, the city manager, under the salary and benefits stated, effective January 2nd, and we will cast our votes. Passes unanimously. I bet Craig's watching. Congratulations, Craig. We're excited to work with you. We think this is a, a good thing for the city. We're, we're excited, and obviously, Jim, Somewhat saddened. Apparently, maybe this was your last council meeting to sit next to me, but I bet it's not the last one you attend. So, <laughs> all right. Um, with that, I guess we have no further business, and we are adjourned. <laughs>